Good morning. Good morning, students, community members, uh, Fran Faraz, and your President Brian, who in many ways uh, summarized my talk and the purpose of this conference. It's a very great pleasure to be here this morning among all of you and to talk about a favorite subject. The fact that you are meeting here today and spending a full day to reflect and seriously consider a subject so important as peace is in and of itself quite remarkable. Your approach to this issue is more important than any conclusion that you might reach at the end of the day. Your approach to the subject is what you'll take away with you, whether it's real or abstract. Your approach is what you'll remember after your memory fades all the details. Your approach is what will change your thinking and awaken you. As has been said, the first step is the last step. So, our first step then is to be open, to listen, to set aside our definitions, our beliefs, our theories, our politics, and most importantly, our romantic ideas. How do we even approach peace? We could do it abstractly, intellectually, or as something real and concrete and immediate. I challenge you today to be real and honest as we look together at one small aspect of peace, namely education. By this, I do not mean educating for peace, which is worthy, but I don't mean peace through education, which is also worthy. I do not mean that peace is a theme or a subject or a project for educators. I do not mean that peace can even be taught or learned. It must be approached differently. It must, must be approached individually, not as a subject, but as part of our very fiber, part of our thinking, our feeling, our DNA. But let's approach this in a classical way and look at what it isn't. In last Sunday's New York Times, there were two articles by Jonathan Mailer. The first was titled, Bad Education. And the second was titled, Reformed School. Perhaps some of you saw those articles. Both of them laid out the full spectrum of education as it is today, particularly in this country. Charter schools, Head Start, standardized tests, teachers unions, and underlying all of it was the call for reform. All that Mailer wrote about, and the many calls for change and debate, new standards and reform, these are not the real problem. And they certainly don't approach the issue in a meaningful way, a way that will lead to effective change for students on an individual basis. The real problem is our approach to education as a whole. To demonstrate this in part, let me point out some of the obvious, some of the wrongful approaches uh, as illustrated by their results. The first, think about what education has produced. It has produced what it intends to produce. 
It's no trifling matter that universally the qualities of a bad life, bad life, values implicit and explicit in school curricula are the values of the worldwide marketplace. And these are getting power over others, gathering, collecting, and keeping as much stuff as you can in your life, getting revenge on your enemies, and they are everywhere, drugging yourself one way or another to forget that you're not really quite human. Next, in schools and at home, children are surrounded by psychological and spiritual rituals, rules, and mandates. These merge with their emotional life and shape and form their inner life and character. Next, the American Council on Education and the Cooperative Institutional Research Program at UCLA conducted a survey recently on the essential reasons students go to college. The results? The number one reason students go to college, and this is a quote from the survey, to be very well off financially. Top of the list. And having a meaningful philosophy of life or leading a quiet, peaceful life was at the bottom of the list. Something is wrong. Next, from age 5 to 21, there are exactly 141,600 hours. Children in Europe, in America, and perhaps all too soon in India and China, spend 46,720 hours sleeping. And the remaining 93,000 hours spent in front of a television set or sitting at a desk in school. This points to an enormous misunderstanding of free time. Next. Most children, even from second and third world countries, are conditioned to sophisticated technology and overzealous spokespeople selling them other people's ideas, information, beliefs, and worst of all, second-hand truth. Next. Too many of the youth of the world are inwardly troubled. They barely survive in the cultures that are competitive and use pressure and violent means to succeed. Look close at hand for evidence of what inner conflict does to the young mind. It produces a deadly despair. Every 78 seconds, a teenager in the United States attempts suicide. 16 of those will succeed. The competitive way of life has produced bad marriages, family problems, unstable and fractured relationships, feelings of meaninglessness, and addictions to drugs and alcohol. So, the definition of what is a whole and sane life is communicated through our schools, secondarily in our families, in a direction that is in no way conducive to inner peace. I maintain that it is the definition of education, it is the definition of education, the approach to education, that is wrong, or at least has been badly defined. It has been shown there is a direct and significant relationship 
between the goals of education and school and what children grow up to value, and between how the school structures and orders the world of the child and the way children relate to the world at large as adolescents and youth. There is a small group of schools in the world that have for the last 75 years been challenging and approaching education in a different way. There is a different way to educate children. These schools have been significantly impacted, as have I, by the educational work of educator Jiddu Krishnamurti. There are five million copies of his books that are read around the world. Of the hundred million words in his teachings, the majority of it is on education. We have a school here in California, the Oak Grove School, north of you in the mountains behind Ventura and Santa Barbara. When that school was founded 35 plus years ago, he said, we're not preparing students for life. We're not teaching them how to survive, how to adapt, or to cope with life. We want to awaken their intelligence. He went on to say, and the schools support this, that the purpose of education is to educate the whole child, to help them understand how the mind works, so that they can live a life of understanding themselves first, who they are, and the whole process of the movement of fear, conflict, jealousy, competition, and other subjects. In this learning environment, children feel safe and are secure as they are getting a very high level academic education, coupled with a parallel stream of psychological education. Parents are part of this educational process. And while they come from all over the world and from different backgrounds, they work at least not to go against what the, the, educa the education is attempting to accomplish. When my daughter, who was one of the first students at the school, left and went on to graduate from medical school, came back, I asked her about her life in school, at our school, when she was young. And she vouchsafed her life with these words. Daddy, I learned how to learn. I learned how my mind works. I felt she had been educated. Our perception of who we are and our place in the world is often directly linked with the circumstances of birth, family, community, and nation. Our schools encourage and support but a very limited and confined view of ourselves. So it's not surprising that we graduate self-absorbed, ethnocentric young people with little social conscience, little compassion, or awareness of others. Clearly, worldwide, we don't truly care that parents don't know how to raise their children intelligently. Schools don't seem to know the importance of psychological education, and society doesn't understand its responsibility towards emerging new generations. Most children are not loved and appreciated for their uniqueness or their potential as emerging intellectual, intelligent beings. Whether we recognize it or not, Humanity is crying out for order, for love, for compassion, 
and the ending of fear. You can feel it, you can see it, not only in this room, if you watch television, as you listen to the news, in the classroom, everywhere, people are looking and hoping in that direction. But we all have to live differently. We have to live as undivided people. First, by looking at ourselves and understanding ourselves. And understanding that there has to be a deep psychological change. Even small change is adequate. Even small change is good. For thousands of years, self-knowledge has been on the lips of many cultures, despite the fact that most don't know what it means. It is possible in this century that knowing oneself can emerge as a core value in education, so as to inform and transform the social and psychological network of hum humankind. A new social order of individuals, standing alone but deeply connected and responsible as powerfully contributing parts <coughs> of society is called for. Then human culture will change. Our disconnected small selves will be different and we'll be, we will be personally responsible and possibly the thousands of years of tears can be washed away. How do, we, how do we do this? How do we approach this? First, can we admit that children submit to schooling but are not truly educated? Their brains are developed to function in highly technical, abstract, linear, mechanistic fields where memory, professionalism, cleverness, aggressive self-assertion are the highest virtues. Therefore, we have to change the approach so students learn the right place of knowledge and with it a very fine mental discipline as only one aspect of their education. Then we need to add to the already clearly defined education of the intellect, the education of the psyche. This would include psychological change through self-knowledge, and most important of all, understanding others, and how the mind works through several approaches. The approach of looking and listening and learning. If done, this will free children of psychological dependence. In your bags, as you came in, you received a piece of paper called The Art of Living and Learning. I would suggest if you could take it out and let's look at it briefly. These are called arts because there is no fixed, rigid curricular content to these arts. These arts are learned as awareness and sensitivity flower in the student. And of course, this depends on, greatly on the relationship between the student and the teacher. Under the art of inquiry, there is self-reflection. Self-reflection can be learned. Art of communication. Listening. Listening can be learned. It is not something that we do automatically. We hear automatically. But we don't listen easily. Here, listening means putting aside prejudice, putting aside points of view, putting aside educated knowledge for true listening. Under the art of engagement, attention. 
What does it mean to pay attention? I'd like to just tell you a little story at that point, at this point. Years ago, Krishnamurti was giving a talk to students in one of the schools, and I was sitting at the back with a few students. In the course of the talk, a lizard ran along the back wall of the auditorium, sometimes called a gecko. A child sitting next to me looked at the gecko, kept looking, kept looking, and I thought the child wasn't listening. So I drew the child back, his attention back to the speaker. At the end of the talk, Krishnamurti came up to me and he said, I saw what you did. He said, let every child watch geckos. It's the attention he pays to a gecko that will help him in every aspect of life. Let him follow every gecko he ever sees. Well, I was a young teacher and I was rightly admonished. <laughs> Further, under aesthetics, sensitivity and appreciation of beauty. Children need to be surrounded with beauty. Appreciation of beauty is something that can be deepened and the sensitivity to it widened well beyond art. We're talking about the beauty of a face, the beauty of a gesture, the beauty of an attitude. These all require sensitivity and awareness. Under the self, self-understanding and awareness. These can be learned. Others, again, self-reflection and awareness. <coughs> Key components of even being conscious and aware of others. Local and global communities. Stressing the service aspect of this. And the, envi the environment. Mindful stewardship. This is most significant, and the order on this page does not indicate the value. It's all of these are number one. So, the questions that we conclude with are questions that should be asked by all teachers, all students, all parents. What is education? Why are we being educated? And why has education become such a huge problem? These are questions for us to ask at the grassroots, at the ground level. Because real education policy must come from the ground roots, not from President Obama, not from politicians and bureaucrats and departments of education. All of this must be demanded by parents. Learning and educational policy should be one of our most significant and most important resources. Conferences, attention to the details of a child's education by a parent, Attention to all of these elements by a teacher should be the focus, the most important aspect of their lives. The highest profession in the world, the most significant profession in the world, is that of an educator. So, I challenge all of you to create a wholly new approach to learning and education, and therefore, the art of living. Redefine education. Don't just reform old concepts or old government policies. Redefine it. Then we will graduate young people who are intelligent, compassionate, and caring. Take it on. Take it on for yourself and others. There is no 
higher way, there is no better way to spend a life than in the awakening of intelligence. Peace then comes real, honest, actual for each person in the world. It's a meaningful, it is a significant way to live. Thanks for listening.